Good evening and welcome at the Diplomatic Academy for our kickoff event, Studying and Practicing Digital International Affairs. Um, when we started our discussion, how we can integrate digital affairs into the work of the Diplomatic Academy, I immediately thought about Elon Musk uh, and Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, because whenever I go to the Austrian foreign ministry or to other foreign ministries, they always tell me these people are more important than the leaders of Afghanistan or of Kazakhstan or of Peru. Uh, and at the beginning, I was not convinced. But more and more, you can say that uh, uh, without accepting what's happening in the digital turn, we will not be successful in international affairs. This is the reason why we have such a kick-off event for studying and practicing digital international affairs. And then I was actually further encouraged to continue along this way when I got a new book by Henry Kissinger and Eric Schmidt called The Age of AI, Artificial Intelligence. And only two days ago, actually, I read one of these long articles in Financial Times, which I can always recommend to see what's happening in the world, which was reporting on a report in science about diplomacy, <laughs> this strategic war game diplomacy, where obviously an AI uh, installation called Cicero was winning largely against humans uh, in this diplomatic in diplomacy game. Uh, and the result was in this commentary, well, if Artificial intelligence is already by now able to do strategic work, which includes cunning, deceit, lies, and other things. What about the moral side of, of digital international relations, digital international affairs? These are one of the few things you can, will be able to read uh, all the time in media, uh, but not so much in research. So that's why we thought we will try to discuss how can we relate to this digital turn in the study field and also certainly in the practice of international affairs? It's coming certainly with from other interests, from economic interests, business interests, and uh, diplomacy came quite late to this idea of teaching also on, on digital affairs. Uh, so this is a start to discuss these things, and I'm happy that we have uh, a group of people from different backgrounds and with different experience with digital affairs, but all of them, I guess, convinced that this is really a digital turn, uh, which I can say, as in the name of the Diplomatic Academy, we are also convinced that this is true. So welcome again, and I pass over to our Dean, Markus Kontrups. Emil, uh, thank you very much for your introduction. Um, let me welcome you to this, uh, to this evening. Um, director said it already, so Digital International Affairs is going to be a new master program, the first one we've added to our family of master programs in about two decades. The last one was the ETIA. Um, and the ETIA already reacted to something that was happening in the real world, uh, something like perhaps a green turn. And, uh, and with uh, the DIA, Digital International Affairs Master, we're going to react to uh, something uh, that has happened in the technological field, something like a digital turn. And uh, the idea of the program will be um, to link together the social sciences, and let's just call them the hard sciences, um, and also uh, to bridge theory and practice basically the gist of it. Um, and um, when you look at our panelists today, then, uh, then you see basically where we are headed. Let me briefly introduce them to you. Uh, so we have on the, so to say, hard sciences, um, we have Professor Edgar Weipel from uh, the University of Vienna. And um, Fantastic publication record, uh, specialized in particular in security and privacy. Um, Edgar, many, many thanks for being here, and please join me in welcoming him. <laughs> and uh, then uh, we have another one who really knows uh, what she speaks about when she talks about data science from the TU Wien. 
to the left of me is Julia Neithardt. Please join me for a round of applause to her as well. Has also published very, very widely in the field. Um, then on the uh, social science side, on the political science side actually, and from our very own, um, hello to um, Tatiana Kuto. <laughs> <laughs> specialize in particular on political communication and there's a lot to say about political communication and the digital turn. And then last but certainly not least, uh, we have a practitioner here amongst us as well. He's actually not only a practitioner, but he also teaches uh, all kinds of digital um, matters. It's Benjamin Mertzinger and he's the co-founder of Nista.io. I hope I pronounced that halfway. It's not old enough to have a consensus on how to pronounce it. Okay, good. <laughs> Nista is fine. Okay, good. Benjamin, welcome to us as well. And uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I have a privilege now, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask all kinds of questions that interest me for about half an hour, and then feel free, please, uh, to join in after this half an hour, and then we're going to do this much more uh, interactively. Um, Edgar, if I may, I'm going mm -hmm. sure. to start with you. Um, your research on security and privacy, and you really have uh, researched a lot there and published a lot there from different angles and everything. What international dimensions are there? So in what ways should a school like us, a school on international affairs, care about digital and care about security and privacy? Um, I think, I mean, obviously security is an Every professor says this about his or her own topic is uh, is relevant and, and extremely important. But uh, so, but security and uh, privacy, are obviously, with uh, digitalization becoming more important. In the in this context, I think uh, <clears throat> the the idea of um, uh, we do no, in many cases no longer meet in person. We have uh, digital communication. The <clears throat> concept of identity and um, attributing actions to a specific identity is um, becoming more important or is <clears throat> a position that can be at easily attacked. So if you, know, if, if you meet someone in person, you can be pretty sure that you're talking to the right person, or at least in the past it was. Uh, you somehow established through because people knew each other personally and through documents, uh, you, you established the identity that you were sure that you really talked to the in, political matters that this is really the president of a nation that you're talking to. Uh, to in digitally uh, <clears throat> facilitated communication, this is harder. So are, are you really talking to this person? And in the past, it was quite hard to forge uh, video. I mean, we all have seen uh, great deep fakes. You can uh, f <clears throat> forge the, the image. Um, currently, it's still a bit harder if, if you turn your head to the side. But in a couple of years, we'll also have a... a, like a, a, a 3D uh, view uh, <clears throat> of uh, important politicians that you can fake it, you can fake the voice, so it's much harder to, to really know if you're talking to the right person. And this is always the same, um <clears throat> the, the same problem or the same underlying um, um, challenges. With whom are you actually talking? The communication, be it also in pure, pure technical sense, if two components talk, are those components really the components that uh, they claim to be? And also in, with people communicating, are you talking to the right people? Um, and this is actually pretty hard to uh, solve. No, thanks a lot. Because that is, uh, that is, that is and, and you've, you've seen probably these examples and, and everything. So for diplomacy, for instance, that can be a real challenge, right? So if there's a teleconferencing uh, happening between, say, two state leaders, and on the one side is a deep fake, then that's, uh, that really is an, is an issue. Um, Julia, uh, you have uh, researched quite a bit on digital humanism. And I want to ask you about this because, uh, so in the scholarly field, one hears more and more about digital humanism, not always very well defined. And um, in the practical sphere, actually, as well. So, uh, so even in the foreign ministry here, there's oftentimes a lot of talk about, uh, about, uh, about the concept and, and, and what it could do for international affairs. So maybe ask you that question. So what is it, digital humanism? And, uh, and what can it do for international affairs? 
So, um, yeah, thank you uh, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And so, uh, maybe a bit um, so broader. Uh, I am um, doing my research really in the area of data science and have now for several years um, done a lot in, in the area of recommender systems and personalization. And you know, so recommender systems, uh, you have them everywhere on the web, and then, you know, Netflix is very well known for it, Amazon, but basically it's, it's everywhere. If you go to a platform, the information you see, it's, it's, it's filtered and it's personalized, and it's due to the I mean, uh, information overload, so, so it would not be possible with, without this system. So, but the issue is that kind of recommender systems do not have a, a, a good reputation anymore, and, and to some extent. And there are, there are all these, these, these phenomena that occurred um, with, with, with the web, um, like these fake news and filter bubbles and, and, and yeah, Cambridge Analytica, this micro-targeting and um, recommender systems and personalization are to some extent related with these phenomena. So this is, this is kind of like my, 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 my research, my background, and also like all these, these other aspects of data science. We talk a lot about biased data, fairness, now, but one reason why we are talking about it is that there is like the, the, the kind of the urge from also computer science people um, to do actively something against the things. And so this is now uh, the broad, broader uh, answer. Um, and this digital humanism initiative that kind of um, was started basically next door. I mean, it's, it's also a broader initiative, but we here at TU Wien, um, took kind of an active role, I would say, and, and, and why um, this um, became important also in Vienna was due to a workshop where different stakeholders came together, but it was really right next door here at the, at the Computer Science Institute uh, where we organized an interdisciplinary and international workshop uh, where we kind of um, wanted to um, name the problems a bit more concretely and also um, have some ideas um, which, which things have to be tackled. And this was then the, the Vienna Manifesto on Digital Humanism. And so this was in April 2019. And this was kind of the starting point for this initiative in Vienna. So not only from Theo Wien, but Theo Wien plays, plays kind of a crucial role there. And, and so this is my, so I'm, I'm, I was active there, I still am. And yeah, since then we have a lot of um, activities, uh, talks, workshops, and, but also more concrete things to think what, what can be really, uh, what, what can, could really be done to, to tackle some of these issues. I mean, it's not only about fake news, it's, it's a lot of aspects, but, but um, the question is also, um, so what, what can computer science scientists do and what could we do together with the society and, 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 and politics to, to tackle some of these issues? Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. I'm definitely going to ask more questions about this later on. Um, Benjamin, I looked at your web page and, um, and there you say that um, you want to empower non-data scientists to analyze uh, data. And uh, so my, my question to you would be um, the digital turn probably empowers and disempowers some people, right? Um, how can, one, how can one really make sure to empower people who just don't have the kind of technological know-how needed <coughs> to understand all kinds of things? Well, that's a rather broad question, isn't it? Um, so the main idea, maybe to, to bring it back to the origin of, of your question, um, the problem that we solve is there are a lot of engineers out there. I w I'm a mechanical engineer myself. And what I got to learn is I learned throughout my studies at also TU Wien, um, about mechanics and electrical engineering and how to build a car, more or less. But as soon as I got out of, of, of my studies, of my ma when I did my master's and, and started my PhD also at TUV, the only problems that I faced were basically, we have a ton of data, we don't know what to do, and some people tell us that it's valuable somehow. And I didn't even know what the database was. And, and so I started off doing my little Excel sheets and stuff like that. And it obviously wasn't, uh, didn't suffice at all. And so I had all this knowledge in my mind and in my head that I learned, but I couldn't really apply it to a more and more digitalized world. And that already is five years ago, and it 
only got worse in some extent since then. And still my colleagues at Toyovin, they do have one semester where they have one course in programming and that's obviously not enough. Um, so they are all more and more excluded and they're having more digitalized systems around them which they end up not being able to interact with anymore because back then I was just going to machine and then interacting with it physically, but more and more, I also in an international sp context, I need to be able to connect with machinery as a mechanical engineer through digital ways. And, and, if, and that, that requires me to know much more than just how those machines work. And there's only so much you can ask from people. I, I was um, lucky enough to have three more years to do my PhD to also learn about informatics and all the things that I now know, but that cannot be the solution to, to expect from people that they know everything, everything mechanical engineers had to know before, and also informatics. This is just, it's, I mean, it's two studies, basically. So they need to be empowered in a sense because otherwise we lose all those people and we don't really make use of their knowledge and there's a lot to be, lo to, to be lost because what we are doing now is we care about energy efficiency, so we have all those engineers and we try to empower them to apply their knowledge to make industrial manufacturing more sustainable. And we are not able to, we cannot afford to lose their ability and their knowledge just because they cannot interact with digital tools anymore. And, and this is maybe a small fraction of what my answer could have been to your question, but yeah, maybe also to give you some context on where we are coming from and where this specific um, mission comes from. Yes, no, thanks, makes a lot of sense. Um, Tatiana, one of your research projects is about um, how Europe communicates um, using, amongst other things, online channels. Do you have any findings about that already? <laughs> uh, well, it, um, the good news is that it has improved, so it's, uh, but uh, the bad news is that there's still a long way to go to put in very generic terms. So basically my research here, that's my project, the project I carry out at DA, we, uh, I use a mixed method, so there's a bit of qualitative um, uh, analysis as well, but also looking at uh, textual data and what um, EU communication service and different EU institutions produce in terms of um, uh, tweets, in terms of press releases, for example, declarations uh, 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 to, to the press, interviews and so on, and to see how different institutions engage with journalists and how do they engage with the general public, right? So there is this um, traditional view that the EU that uh, doesn't communicate and doesn't connect very well with the citizens and therefore it gives the uh, impression uh, that it's very distant uh, very far from uh, the, the citizens uh, and uh, ordinary people cannot really understand and the documents and uh, media materials it produces are not engaging. Not engaging is an uh, euphemism and that it's pretty boring. Um, so that's what I do, like use a, a textual data analysis to see how this has evolved over time. What we see is that there is no unified communication strategy for the EU, right? As And we do see this for other um, ways of handling different EU institutions, how they are organized. So there's um, a lot of variation. You see European institutions, EU institutions like the European Central Bank, for example, that communicate really well. They made uh, um, a lot of documents accessible to the public, could be more engaging, but still there's a lot of transparency, more than what people think, uh, compared to other institutions that is still rely a lot on technical documents, which is, it's not that information, it's not there. Um, it is basically, the problem is the other way around, is that we have too much information and people get lost, or and journalists get lost, right? The frequent complaint of journalists is not that, oh, I don't get my accreditations, because they do, and it's not they don't, they don't receive information from new institutions, because they do, but the main problems uh, interviews with journalists have uh, shown is that um, they take too long. Too long could be a week, for example. That for a journalist is super long. Like you want to call a person and the person explains to you in three minutes, uh, answer your question in three minutes, I can write my text and send to my editor. So institutions uh, take a lot of time to react 
and send a lot of information and will give you 100 pages of documents. And for the journalist, this is a nightmare, right? Unless you have a lot of time to delve into that. But um, this is the main complaint. So there's, um, we have seen, just to summarize a bit the results we have so far, a little bit of change in that uh, communication culture, but it's still very disconnected. Uh, people, when they enter the, um, uh, when they become civil EU civil servants, they usually do not come from this background in communication, right? They uh, rotate among different, uh, they perform different functions in the institutions. And that technocratic part, the technical, the importance, uh, um, this technocratic part many times takes over. So uh, just to summarize, it has improved. The EU does use its social media channels, but uses pretty much in the way your parents or your grandparents would use. Um, try to avoid as much as possible any uh, video that may be uh, funny or means, or th for them this is nightmare. They really don't want to go there because they think it's not serious and the, uh, the organization, the institutions are not going to be taken seriously instead of embracing that type of language, especially when you need to connect with young people. So that's a major uh, gap that has to do with the organizational culture as well, so it's not just communicating, right? Communicating reflects a way how relationships take place within EU institutions. Um, so there has been improvement, but it's still a long way, a long way to go. I'm happy to answer questions about how I carry out the study and other questions or curiosities you, you may have about the topic. Yeah, no, but that's super interesting. And it sounds a bit like a lowest common denominator communication, but we can, yeah. we can get mm -hmm. further into that, yeah. Um, Edgar, usually when basically, so you, you, you deal with, with problems uh, arising out of the digital turn and perhaps how to deal with them, security, privacy. Um, sometimes some, some new invention happens and then there's a big lag and then at some stage a resolution or a solution to the problem is being found. Um, with the examples that you've given beforehand, uh, deep fakes, for instance, are there solutions on the horizon? So is it, is it uh, in the foreseeable future, is it going to be much easier to detect these deep fakes and all kinds of other issues? Is it easier to attribute uh, identity, protect one's own identity? Like with many other so things in security, we never really solve the problem. It keeps us in business. Yeah, so mm -hmm. can you always, you we propose a, a solution that partially or um, at least in, in some aspects solves it, but then there's a better attack and we can publish yet another mm. uh, um, solution. Uh, so it, it security actually ends up in an arms race. We see this in, 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 in software security. This mm. has been a problem for 30 years, but we, if we're honest, we don't really solve it. <coughs> um, and uh, which is fun for, because, because it keeps you in business, but it doesn't, doesn't really help in the long term. But, it, but it's a hard problem. And just also coming back to what, what you said, like um, you communicating uh, or could communicate better using social medias and I don't know, probably Facebook and Twitter and, and Insta and, and, and other instances. And those are s systems that then also filter the information, who sees what, and that's also kind of tied into recommender systems. And the security perspective is also how, always how can we misuse such a system. So uh, there were several settings, how can we influence it that uh, then only um, some aspect that people perceive that a certain group perceives negatively of the EU and mainly sees, I don't know, some, some, some tiny regulation that doesn't make too much sense and you only see this and then you say, well, the EU is a waste of money because you only see this aspect. And, and in terms of, um, um, it, it's not just one, uh, uh, one nation, but uh, the entire EU, then basically if, if we take this way, and I, I'm not saying that we should or should not do that, that's outside the scope of my expertise, but there's a risk in it that a, a couple of institutions companies control the communication of, of, of that. And in terms of digital sovereignty, I think personally, I think it's a really bad idea because then like three companies decide what journalists see about EU communication. So, and this, and if, if I'd like to start a war, probably by selectively choosing who sees what, I can make groups of people hate each other and then start fighting. I mean, that's maybe slightly uh, exaggerated, but um, controlling this information, putting uh, this uh, this control of information selection into hands of 
people, I mean, we've all read changes in Twitter, I don't know what, what your personal opinion is, but there's a lot of power in those, in those, uh, in those um, systems. <clears throat> and even if the people who operate it might not completely understand it, um, <clears throat> there are always side effects. We've seen this with chatbots, uh, that uh, people kind of for fun make, 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 make them into racist chatbots by, by giving them specific information that they then uh, communicate in an inappropriate way. And so there, there are many, many ways one can attack this. And, and this is something that, that I, as a, not, not in my scientific expertise, but as a citizen, worry about. And, and that is, I think, a topic that should be, that should be addressed. And I think that fits well into this uh, study, study program. Yeah, definitely. No days. I mean, like like with any technological breakthrough, probably there are a lot of things to, lots of reasons to worry, and lots of actually reasons to re, to be very happy and 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 and, and, and look uh, look quite optimistically into the future. It's basically uh, they're both both possibilities. The question is uh, which one is gonna is gonna prevail in the end. That brings me back perhaps to my digital humanism. <laughs> um, if uh, do you think that digital humanism, so the manifesto or uh, or uh, more elaborations on it, can ever be something like an like an like a foundation to think about digital matters from a normative point of view? I'm just asking again because of these. So with practitioners' debates about. Uh, um, say within the EU, there are all kinds of attempts not to regulate more and more uh, um, the, the, the digital side of things. Um, um, UN, some kind of a digital compact and everything. Um, is, and, and, and then one would need some kind of a normative guidance about how something like that would have to look like. Digital humanism, could that be? such a foundation. Um, yeah, so this is uh, this is one of the ideas. I mean, it's very interesting because you say the technology, so when we, um, I mean, also one of, of the, 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 fir the first sentences here in the, in the manifesto is exactly because um, Tim Berners-Lee, who is uh, the, the, the founder of the World Wide Web, he was then saying the system is failing. I mean, and if you think back, kind of the, uh, the beginning of the web, it was, there was so much hope like in this technology that it brings people more together actually so especially also I mean if you say about like all types of relation could have been improved because the, the idea was that that information is more accessible that, that people can also get to know things so not mediated or, or through the, the, the typical media but they can connect and then and, and find what they want and then this completely went wrong and there is also the question why did it uh, go wrong that, that badly and this this is one of the questions one, one has to analyze this and, and also one of the questions digital humanism wants to um, like, like understand or, 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 or yeah. But um, of course, so this, we see it also, I mean, this, this whole initiative, um, of course, as a, as a way to, 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 to um, as you said, to build a foundation, maybe a framework to reflect on things, to analyze things, but also um, to have some um, suggestions how to do it better also, of course, in a, in a normative way, as you would say. And um, yeah, so it's, it's um, things changed uh, also within these companies, um, like also with the, with the fake news and also with, with um, maybe these, these incidents with, with the chatbots who became racist suddenly. I mean, these this were all then situations where the companies also had to change something and also to think about yeah, the, the, the biased data or, or more ethical approaches, but they do do it because of uh, public pressure and political pressure, and so this is the reason why we, why we have to talk about this. So I think this is very important. Yeah. So and then um, yeah, we should we should raise these 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 issues and concerns. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Benjamin, on this, on this, on, the, on this debate about uh, opportunities and perils of the digital world, where, where do you stand there? It's also a very broad question for you. Um, I'm just coming up with this, this sort of really from my, from my international relations, international securities point of view, because it's very interesting because you basically what you do is so you bring together the machine, as you put it before, and the digital, the, the mechanical engineering and the digital, 
and uh, that obviously has now in, 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 in politics can have very far reaching uh, repercussions, so it's even in terms of weapon systems and everything. Mm. This is why I, 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 I ask you the question. Mm. So, where do I stand? Um, something that probably is important um, is that this whole technology, n not a single meaningful problem that we have to solve today, I would argue, is a technological one. Um, what we see and what, why I think study programs like what you try to, to build here um, are so important is that it doesn't make sense or even is dangerous to, to leave the technology and what it implies to those people that have created it. It's, th this is just a dangerous thing to see, to do. It, with Edgar, you brought up the topic of, of it, it might be a bad idea to, to leave the communication of the world in just the hand of three private owned companies. And it could be a problem. We have actually seen such, such instances already where just the lack of moderation of Facebook groups in, I can't re say the, 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 the country anymore because I just don't remember, led to violent outbreaks in said countries. So th this is just an, a fundamentally um, dangerous thing. And where does it come from? It comes from IT people doing IT stuff for the sake of doing it. And they had the best of intentions. So Google, Google started off as do no, do no harm, I believe. So they, they, it just happens. And it's due to the fact that it's not all just understanding technology. It's also underst about understanding what the implications are. And implications can be, in my case, how can we now operate mechanical systems more efficiently, but also how can we communicate better? How can we, co how can we um, not just control dangers that come up when, when we develop as a, as, as, as a species, but also how can we maybe um, come up with, with, with good things that, that implies that engineers might not think about? So I, I still think I didn't answer your question, but... Um, <laughs> The thing that I want to hammer home is it's incredibly important to not leave digital or any other techno te technological advancement that will happen over the next few years to those that created it, but rather understand what it implies and then translate that to your own field. And diplomacy is one thing, politics is one thing, social sciences is one thing, Pol anything has not just to deal with the implications of new technologies, and that's also not new. I mean, industrialization changed everything. Uh, and so there, there are many things like that. But we need to understand what it implies so that we can then keep the world a reasonably good place or make it even better. So, yeah. No, that's a very good answer. <laughs> oh, I hope so. <laughs> um, Tatiana, I have a very, very big question for you. Apologies for that. But uh, there's always this thing that, that, that is on, on my mind about so political communication. Mm -hmm. So way back then, 1960s or something, uh, Marshall McLuhan distinguished the radio and the television, right? So the radio to him was a hot medium, something that, that conveys emotions very well, for better or for worse, actually. And uh, t television, a cold medium, which to him, I mean, whether that's true or not, question mark, but which to him appeared to be more rational or something like that. Would it be possible to put a single label on digital political communication? Yeah, that's a really big question, indeed. <laughs> uh, short answer, I would say, uh, no, it's not possible to put a single um, label, but uh, the analogy you make with the, when we look at technological changes today, social media and traditional media, um, and compared it to uh, when TV started to be used for political communication or in political uh, electoral campaigns uh, as well, um, I think we can, there are several lessons that we learn when uh, main medium of communication changed from radio to TV, that is mainly the speed with which information is um, uh, today is exchanged and not just sent, not just broadcast from TV to the public, but uh, more in a two-way or in terms of, or in uh, uh, in, neuro, in networks, um, if you like. But uh, I think the main difference, there are several aspects that are important, is that um, 
because of this time compression, uh, if you like, many times we do not allow ourselves or the brain doesn't allow uh, itself time to formulate a proper to reason and reacts much more based on gut feeling, re reacts more uh, instinctively than um, after following a few seconds of re reflection, as is the case of the radio, because if you ever listen to radio debates and two people talk at the same time, you don't listen to any of them, right? If you're watching this uh, and there's a big mass, many people talking at the same time, you still try to make sense of that. And, but going back to the speed of communication, right, is that people then tend to have, as humans, to respond more instinctively without so much critical reasoning, much, uh, much uh, more based on what I said, gut feeling, right? If you know this famous book, Thinking Fast and Slow, and you see there are mechanisms that have to do biologically with um, survival instincts, with, uh, with our biological systems as well, and we will react faster. And what we see is that depending on the message and, the, and how certain issues are framed, they may trigger in us emotions at, such as fear or anxiety, but especially anger, that provoke faster reactions. So by the time you reflected upon a comment or by the time you checked whether this was true or not, you have already retweeted it, right? Or you have already sent it to your family WhatsApp group. If you didn't do it, your parents did, <laughs> or, or your uh, uncle did, or somebody probably in this age group um, has, uh, has done so. At the same time, there is a space still in TV today or in podcasts that it's like radio, but in, in adapted to the 2020s. Uh, there is still, there are different, a, a lot of, um, many more niches of communication, right? And arenas where you do have this space for reflection and debate and people with different views exposing their uh, showing uh, or debating their positions without necessarily getting into conflict. So you have, uh, you have communication happening at many different levels at the same time and in a multi-speed way. So and for this reason, it's not possible to put a single uh, label in saying that, well, social media is causing all this turmoil and social unrest, because at the same time it does that, it connects people. When we learn from, we learn more about situations in countries, you would not know really what was going on in remote places of, uh, I don't know, Asia or Africa or in countries going through conflicts, right? So there, so we also learn. So it's also beneficial. So it's not uh, a matter of labeling all social media is making us all uh, alienated and, and supportive of autocratic leaders, right? So you have both, the, it's very complex uh, dynamics. In the 90s, we used to, 80s, 90s, uh, in international relations, we used to talk about complex interdependency, right? Um, and today we still talk about complex digital interdependency, just to make a discussion uh, broader. Um, that we already, we have already seen these frontiers between what is domestic and what is international. They have become blurred, but this is not new. This is at least 30, 40 years. Um, the distinct, the frontier, the border between what is public and what is private, what is government and what are, what are private actors um, also becomes blurred. But what is relatively new today is this, this frontier between what is real, what is physical, and what is digital also becomes more confusing, right? So this is, and I think this is an additional layer that adds to this complex interdependency that is the, it becomes harder, and when we talk about deep fakes as well, harder to distinguish what is real, um, uh, uh, what belongs to the physical world and what belongs to the virtual world. And that opens the door for a lot of discussions in terms of digital diplomacy, uh, in terms of cybersecurity, protecting cyberspace, right, or regulating cyberspace more or less in, in the same way uh, that we did with the, um, with the high seas, right? I used to think that the high seas and this doctrine of Mari Liberum, that it doesn't have to be regulated because its resources are infinite, right? And later on, we've, we saw that, no, it has to be regulated somehow because we cannot keep using it. The resources are not infinite. And I think the same uh, dynamics will follow for uh, digital or cyber or virtual space, uh, whenever you want to, um, to call it. But no, so no, not one single label. <laughs>
Ja, yeah, but the, the fast thinking, yeah. slow thinking, that, that really makes me think, because there, there may be something to that. Fast or yeah. slow? Uh, no, no, uh, <laughs> um, sl uh, fast. I mean, so, so just not, uh, so less reflection. That's, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I have one final question to all of you, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up for, for, for debate. Um, if you would have to design, Edgar, I'm going to start with you, but I mean, any, or anyone can, can tell me, if you would have to design now, a master's program on digital international affairs. What would you say are components or courses or modules, however you want to call it, that really absolutely would have to be in there? Uh, <coughs> so you're checking whether we, we check the syllabus of... Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no I'm just um, to, be, <laughs> to be inspired. <laughs> um, yeah, <coughs> obviously, um, you always live for your own discipline, so I think um, obviously security <laughs> is an important topic. Um, but uh, it, it goes beyond the technical technical aspects of security, um, and I think um, what what security can bring to to such a, um, a program is um, and in international affairs, um, adversarial thinking is is something that that people are aware of. So you. Um, you can always and you always need to and I think that's what computer science people in, in security are good at is thinking of how you can misuse a system and how which border cases can lead to an unintended behavior and this not only applies to technical systems but also to social technical systems where you have computers and people or people act, acting uh, through computers that, for instance, uh, are used for communication. And I think this is an, um, <clears throat> in particular, if um, communication becomes faster um, uh, and, and more global, a few bad actors um, can do much more harm. So if, if, if um, and can do harm much quicker because communication is, is, um, is faster than in the past. So if it takes a couple of weeks uh, to send a letter to someone, um, <clears throat> if, if you claim some, some, something that is uh, not correct, the, uh, the counterparty has more time to react. Um, today you can, you can um, spark a conflict in, in a very short uh, time. And I think this is an aspect that uh, is important. We'll be in there. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go next? Uh, order of things doesn't necessarily matter, but <laughs> if you want to. I mean, um, yeah, so uh, very uh, good question. I mean, I'm, I'm also now answering from, from my field a bit. Um, and I think, as I said, I'm, I'm working a lot in, in, in this personalization. And um, it has an impact, actually, on, on all this online communication, as we said. And I, I, would, I would think it would be good to teach also that um, kind of to understand um, yeah, a bit more how these algorithms work, actually. Um, like, because they have also a very specific property, like this personalization, because they make a recommendation to somebody, and then um, you would maybe click on something, and, and, and then they take this as a um, kind of um, yeah, input again. So, and, and so they have this feedback loop, and, and this is also why these this dynamics over time can, can really become a bit like um, how it becomes, like narrow down some, some perspectives. And, and I think it's important to, to understand like also what the input data can have, um, which consequences, how these dynamics of the systems can be, and, and what the output data is. So to, to understand how this personalization and filtering can lead to, where are the issues, maybe a more concrete examples, and also but what, what I mean, what has an impact and what not, what, what data they use to operate, because I know that everybody is talking about it, but, but actually, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, knowledge about it would be, would be good, especially when working in communication and, and, and international affairs, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so. definitely, yeah, and the sense of transparency. Does you want to go next, maybe? Okay, uh, we want uh, to go next. It's <laughs> almost a weird situation. Then no, we no, 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 I, that's my mistake. Let's just uh, keep the order of things. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, I'm not answering from my field, um, but maybe I am. So, <laughs> as, as, as a startup, what we have to face is a, is a, a fast changing, uh, insecure environment doing stuff that nobody else did before, hopefully, um, or at least not successfully. 
Um, and that entails that we need to tackle um, challenges and problems in a certain way. Uh, and and I, would, I would argue that this, to, to name a few things to make it more specific, like agile and, and stuff like this. So, so things that I had to learn when I got into developing digital products in my case, I think are very mm, valuable things to understand if you go into a field that is probably going to be very similar to what I just described. So an ever so fast, ever much faster changing environment with much insecurity. You need new methods to work in such an environment. And, and I think that would be probably something that I would put in. Um, yeah. Sounds like our tools module, which we have put in, and I don't know, makes sense. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, yeah, I was going to mention this um, e-diplomacy tools or a brief, uh, concise history of e-diplomacy in the same way that we have a history of diplomatic practices. And there are similarities because, uh, I mean, diplomacy and communication are two activities. They cannot be really separated, right? But how does it change when we move to a virtual uh, uh, environment, right? How? Uh, do uh, how does a country increase its voice or increase its presence or maximize its power if you want to use a realist language in in the cyberspace right um, just out of curiosity you may want to have a look at uh, digital index uh, rankings for example you see that and that's a way of measuring a power of the state that not always corresponds to the power that states have in the real uh, physical world. So I think this diplomatic practices, um, e-diplomatic practices, and the whole, and um, IR theories, how, what are the changes that um, we are faced with once we move from uh, geographical borders to virtual fluid uh, borders. Yeah. One last thing, because I always talk a lot. I have a lot of students here, and you know I talk a lot. But um, I think that it would be necessary to invest uh, at least to a minimum in um, making people more knowledgeable in terms they learn how to code or at least they overcome uh, some sort of uh, maths uh, and coding traumas. And we talked about this in the open house, uh, a virtual open house two days ago. I myself come from a background uh, of uh, qualitative research. I was not good at maths like at all at school. I didn't like it at all, uh, but being uh, by learning uh, and starting, learning by doing, starting to, to code and to look at data in a different way, that gave me um, a very different understanding of, uh, of how discourses are organized, how um, yeah, discursive strategies uh, are organized. And I think it's a very valuable skill that you can, we call it in, in our academic curriculum, transferable skills, because they are still valuable in your curriculum, even if you don't want to work in international affairs, even if you don't want to become a diplomat or uh, do an internship in the UN or whatever. Uh, there are still skills that are highly valued at a workplace, right? And you really, uh, changes the way you reason in terms of research and in terms of solving problems. So, yeah, I would say um, e-diplomacy, practice and history, IR theory, and coding, uh, hands-on training. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense, too. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So then we're going to move now to the questions and answers. And, uh, and go ahead and ask whatever question comes to your mind. Is there a lot of, I think I see a few hands up, so we're going to group always three questions uh, in one, okay? Start. Good evening, my name is Christoph Felt and I'm from Luxembourg. I'm a my two student here at the Academy. Uh, my question revolves around the topic of digital diplomacy. As a result of the past and still ongoing health crisis, humans and technology grew closer perhaps than ever before. Um, given that this is a Master's of Science in Digital International Affairs at the Diplomatic Academy, my question to you is, uh, what diplomatic practices do you believe will become digital, which will not become digital? Are there some that are supposed to become digital and which are not supp so supposed to become digital? Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the interesting discussion. I don't have at all a diplom uh, like a digital background or something, so it was quite insightful. 
Um, my name is Sarah Jersey. I'm also a second year student in the MICE program here at the DA. Um, and I, what I do have is a legal background. <laughs> um, and actually, I'm right now working at a law firm. And the next big thing that we're seeing is the metaverse. So because it's a big legal vacuum, and as you mentioned before, there's um, enough space to be misused um, in, in a legal vacuum. And so my question was, do you think that the metaverse is right now just a trend that is in hype, or do you think that it is actually something that will become important um, in the years? I mean, it's still in its baby shoes right now, but um, do you think that it will become um, important? And um, sorry, and uh, what do you, where do you see the biggest uh, security issues in the metaverse? Thank you. Now we would have one more. Yeah. Don't kill anyone, Melusine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. My name is Maria. I'm a ISTU student. My question will be to Tatiana Kouto. Uh, you mentioned earlier about your research paper, and you said that institutions improved their communication within themselves, but uh, not that much, not on a certain level. What, in your opinion, are the main reasons for it, and what uh, they lack for uh, improvement of communication? Thank you. Mm. Oh, great. Who wants, who wants to take whatever question is if you the, the diplomatic practices if I'm if I if I if I may I can because then the institutions are for you Tatiana the, this that's difficult to tell right because the so 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 the kind of studies that there are now is uh, is so, so because of corona obviously there has been a move of some attempts to negotiate and everything so to do that via teleconferencing and, uh, and there are some studies about this already, and they basically show that the, the um, let's say the soft side of diplomacy is obviously lacking in that. Yeah? So if I negotiate uh, looking at the screen, then it's really just about the text and the formulation and everything. There are no breaks, there is no having a coffee, there is no smoking a cigarette, there is, uh, that's all out of it. Yeah? And apparently trust levels, I mean, it's early studies, but still the trust levels go down in these kind of encounters. Yeah? So if uh, diplomacy is, amongst other things, the, the, the communication uh, of states and, and having communication channels open, then that's probably a bit of a problem. Right? And at the same time, some of the things that Tatiana has mentioned already, like, uh, like public diplomacy and, and, and putting a certain image out there, well, I mean that that uh, that is uh, already quite well established, I think, and 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 some states and some international actors do that much be way better than than, than others. Um, say I don't know the, the 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 U.S. embassy in Vienna, I think, does it very well. It's a former DA student <laughs> who runs the the social media campaign there, um, and and others perhaps perhaps less so. Yeah, but my. Uh, Perhaps my expectation would be that there won't be a radical transformation of diplomacy. There will be an adjustment, yeah? like uh, like in the old days. Uh, so so uh, the telegraph was actually a major invention that s sparked a lot of things in terms of diplomacy, um, but it didn't do away with, say, the resident uh, embassy or something like that. And, uh, and I wouldn't. I would be very surprised if something like that. So if these far-reaching changes would happen with a with a digital one, but it will be adjustment for sure. The metaverse. Who wants to take? Who wants to take that? I can, I can. Yeah. No, go ahead. <coughs> Maybe it's one of those quotes that in uh, 20 years, if I say, I, I don't believe this would be important, uh, that, that, that everyone laughs about. But still, it's funny. Uh, and I'd be uh, honored if, if people remember uh, 20 years what I said. I think, the, personally, why I think it's, um, the success is not, not guaranteed, or I, I think it's not won't be so, so successful, is that I'm not clear what benefit it actually delivers. So what, what, What's better there than we can do now with the digital technology? And as long as this benefit is not not apparent to everyone, um, I think there's there's not much incentive of taking it up. But even if there's no benefit um, and people don't use it, there's you can always uh, anticipate uh, typical security problems that, that exist. There. That's kind of the nice part of security. 
uh, you have security and uh, problems everywhere. So um, <coughs> one that the one that I previously mentioned is when, whenever we move to digital communications, obviously uh, establishing the identity. So who is actually talking or communicating or the entity with which you're interacting? Who is this? Um, <coughs> and this, uh, the other issues that I would look at is incentives. Um, so. Um, as we see in social media, the incentive is uh, that people interact uh, with social media um, and interaction drives up profits and there's a, it's a profit uh, uh, driven company on many social media sites are and therefore um, <coughs> the incentive system is set up so that people uh, emotionally react to things and not think a long time about things and then come to a consensus So having kind of confrontations where people more or less shout at each other uh, is beneficial for, for a company that wants high interaction rates. Uh. So setting up the incentives or if the incentives are not set up correctly in such a system it can also be used. So all these attacks on the incentives are, are things that I would look in. And then if it becomes so important um, um, that, that the entire life uh, or digital life uh, happens in such a uh, it was is, um, is it's then part of a critical infrastructure, and um, who controls this? What happens if this infrastructure fails? Um, those would be typical questions which you can apply to other information technologies. Do well. <coughs> you want to add if, um, if you I want this, to? No, I think it's. Uh, but, yeah. but I mean, I also have the impression that the success is not like it was uh, hoped for. Like yeah. With the metaverse, yeah. it's does not seem to become that relevant as, as it was announced before. Yeah. For example, um, giving uh, yeah, in insurances for the metaverse, like creating a special thing that is just for insurance because it is such a legal vacuum and mm -hmm. you don't know you buy property in the metaverse, but then again, I don't know, a hacker can come and maybe delete everything. I don't know if this is even possible, but and how do you ensure people who actually want to invest in the metaverse? But that, yeah, I, mm. I agree that it hasn't gotten quite the success that people maybe expected it to have. Um, but again, I think that it will very much change in the next few years. So, I yeah, see, but I think relevant questions that you raise here. Yeah. And then, uh, Tatiana, I think one question was... Yeah, um, I think it's basically because it's not that people, the institutions or the people who work there uh, don't think that communication is important. It's just that among other things, that other activities that you have to perform for your job, it's not a priority. So, and our resources, especially in terms of time, uh, they are limited, right? So it, it's just not on the top of the list. That means that you don't have enough people to generate content, for example, to keep posting, to keep engaging with users on social media, for example, or people who have been there for a while. Maybe th this is a trend that may change as we, uh, as new people, uh, younger people, uh, start to work for the EU because they master, they uh, they have a different way of using these codes. But basically, because it's not yet um, a priority. You have to understand that since its inception, the whole idea of European integration was in the very beginning that, well, it, let's focus on the technical aspects to keep the peace, right? So the original idea, if you go back to early 50s, uh, was not to involve people, was not to make it democratic because people in 1952 would never, in 1957, when the Treaty of Rome was signed, etc would never support in a referendum any agreement, Franco-German uh, relationship that close, right? Less than 10 years after the war. So since its inception, it has this technocratic and opaque, non-democratic character. And as from the 80s and 90s, we realized, well, okay, now this is getting actually more serious. It's becoming maybe a, something that is a political union, right? A changing symbols of sovereignty that people thought they were dear to their culture, like the currencies, for example, right? Um, then we have to have the people on board. But then the institutional design is really path dependent. So it, it's still not a priority <coughs> in, in the sense that um, it doesn't uh, receive that many resources. And uh, the organizational culture is still perceived as uh, less important 
issue. So what is more important if you're a civil servant working for EU institutions is not the members of parliament, this is different, but the people who work there is, uh, okay, I have to make this report ready or this, um, uh, this uh, treaty ready because it has, is going to be examined by, uh, by the member states, right? Um, and yeah, basically a priority organizational culture that people keep reproducing that way of behaving where communication, it's not really important, uh, not really strategically important. It is important, but it's not strategic or the type of communication has a more technical character and not enough resources devoted it uh, amid uh, all the other resources that you devote for, um, um, I don't know, agriculture, for example, or an emerging uh, defense strengthening EU's uh, external role, so on. Uh, so on um, and so forth. Could I just make a brief comment on diplomatic practices that shouldn't take place and then I think it's interesting what we see is that in many negotiations and of course it depends, it's a human characteristic that you start to have in negotiations this race to tweet first to be the first diplomat that tweets um, we, made, we have a deal or something like this, and we have evidence of negotiations that were really coming to a close, where a diplomat leaves the room and tweets, and you almost jeopardize the whole deal, right? Because it has become public, then the embassy's back at home, then the other country heard about it, we have the first evidence in um, negotiation, EU, Ukraine, Russia, in and, and 2013. So, uh, and uh, uh, when the deal was almost done, somebody tweeted, uh, uh, yeah, we have a deal. And actually, there wasn't a deal yet. So, uh, uh, so you see it all in the end. Many times, these practices, practice that shouldn't ha shouldn't be done, but are done. There are things that would al also happen in the real physical world. Um, but I think, in terms of behavior, uh, I think diplomats may try to race for okay, which country did it right, or which diplomat or which journalist was the first to publish. Um, this is one thing. Um, a second thing to, to pay attention to that is still highly overlooked is uh, today we tend to see these uh, virtual meetings, even though for us it's still hard to build trust via Zoom. I don't think that for next generations, people who are being, for COVID babies, for example, all these people who, have, who are being born in 2020, 2021, and this year, maybe for them that will not be an issue, right? And we will be the old guys, uh, I will be much older, but uh, you will be the old ones saying that, well, uh, yeah, that maybe they will not distinguish this and they will be able to have as uh, warm interactions as um, virtually as we have face to face. Very last point is something that is severely overlooked is that we tend to see this um, uh, remote work and, and, and meetings via Zoom, despite the fact that it's a bit colder as an, as an environmentally friendly alternative. But keep in mind, there's actually a lot of emissions come from data service and come from streaming, right? That in the future will mount um, about to half of the emissions that all cars produce as well in terms of CO2 equivalent, right? So, and this is something that for the time being, we are a bit behaving as we did towards the seas in the 16th, 17th century. We think that we can all stream uh, as much as we want and there are no consequences, but there will be limits to that. And this will eventually need to be uh, regulated. I just wanted to add this, um, this few points but to keep in mind for future uh, and future generations when you will be the older guys saying that back in the day that was better, <laughs> things were easier, um, and you will be confronted with new ways of behaving, thinking that new generations will, will have. <laughs> More questions? Who wants to ask? Yes. Um, hello, thank you for uh, your very interesting uh, points already taken. Um, my name is Florian Lehmann. I study uh, global studies at the University of Vienna. And I have several questions. Uh, one uh, to Tatiana Kuto. Uh, I thought it was very interesting when you mentioned how the communication within the European Union uh, you know, is lacking of... Mm -hmm. uh, um, they are really trying, but they're not really efficient. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, as the, uh, why that is, and I think one of the main issues is because they are not a single body, right? They are consisting of several bodies, and so um, 
for sure, they do not have uh, always a, a clear strategy in order to communicate efficiently. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, uh, and then you also mentioned that communication is too fast. So I was thinking perhaps some of the tools that we are using today, like Twitter, probably will not use Twitter uh, anymore. <laughs> uh, but perhaps other other uh, tools such as uh, what is it Mastodon, Mastodon? Um, they will perhaps establish a more of time lacking features so that you will not act immediately that you will not tweet immediately you know this kind of spin that we are you know uh, communicating right away is also something that we do not do here, we also wait until it's our turn to communicate, right? And I think we will see this kind of communication behavior in the future. But what is your opinion on this? And um, another question to uh, Professor Kornprobst. Sorry if I pronounce you wrong. No, it was very uh, good. <laughs> also to, to everyone. Uh, for me, it's very interesting to see that globalization processes in the last five to ten years have been kind of like decreased. So uh, in the international um, f like field, and that is very unfortunate as of course the European Union also wants to see a more multilateral world and uh, tools, because I think it is a tool like the internet, uh, becomes more exclusive. So how can we prevent um, a world that is kind of divided in, uh, into regions, you know, we have China now kind of developing their own internet or their own technologies, you know. Uh, how can we have kind of like a digital world where um, Europe is not exclusive? Because this is exactly what happens now with Macedon, right? It's a kind of a network that is um, decentralized. However, and that is awesome, but however, this will have consequences also for multilateralism. So how can we prevent this to happen? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Filippo Laurini. I'm a my two student. I apologize for the rant which is about to come. But, uh, <laughs> but not too long, okay? Rant is okay. Not too long. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so far, I have heard about uh, deep fakes, fake news, screening and addressing digital data, social media, media security, and psychological concerns, but what about cybercrime and its prevention? Will, be, will there be an emphasis, possibly in the form of lectures, on the legal me measures and available conventions one could rely on when addressing the topic of the prevention of cybercrime? For instance, right now we can already rely on the Cybercrime Convention, also known as the Budapest Convention. Luckily, by the time this new study program will start, so September 2023, right? Maybe there will be a, a new convention under the UNODC, pro, uh, elaborated by the Ad Hoc Committee to elaborate a comprehensive international convention on countering the use of information, etc., etc. Because there will be several uh, sessions, I think in the upcoming month of January, then April, and then one, I think it will conclude on the month of September 2023. So, uh, in conclusion, I would like to ask if there could be enough sources and guidelines to address this, uh, one of the most complex and biggest global challenges we are facing now, which is cybercrime, and especially the prevention of cybercrime. That's it. Thank you. Wasn't, wasn't that much of a rant yeah. and wasn't that long. It's okay. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Michael Steger. I'm going to have a very short question. It's for you, for the Dean, for uh, Professor Kornprops. I'm just wondering if there will be any programming classes in uh, the new master. That's it. Sorry, then I didn't get... I'm just wondering classes. if there will be okay, any yeah, programming yeah. Mm -hmm. classes yeah. in the new yes. Digital International Affairs master. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You know, anyone who still has questions, just ask. And please don't forget our super fantastic guests. Because <laughs> me, you can always ask. <laughs> yeah.
Um, my question is to Professor Kuto and uh, Professor Neithard, uh, because it's about personalization. So we just heard about personalization on programming level that algorithm create already tailored layout of each individual's digital space. And at the same time in media politics class, we discuss personalization effects and framing effects that come from the other side, so from mm -hmm. content creators already doing the cherry picking on the content production stage and focusing their effort on particular subjects. Are there already studies that explore correlation between these two sides? So one is personalization on programming side, the other one is on the content creation side. And if not, is it possible to measure how these two kind of biases by, from the other sides effect, kind of combine in, in, in final content that reaches the audience? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. My name is Guillaume Sorel. I'm a French um, second year student reading the MICE um, diploma here at the DA. Um, so approaching my question, diplomacy has historically been a practice um, reserved for the executive or rather a special branch of the executive branch of a state. Um, philosophers such as Immanuel Kant and Machiavelli argued against the democratization of diplomatic um, processes and decisions. However, in recent years, we've seen uh, that foreign policy has been a heavy topic, um, both in elections and also with regards to popularity polls for um, leaders throughout the world, especially in France, the US, and the UK. Um, so my question is the following. To what extent do you think the digitalization of diplomacy will entail its democratization, and is it favorable? Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, then I suggest that we simply go in the in the as as a final round in the in the order in which we started. I'm going to go at the end, and uh, and whatever comes to your mind about the questions or whatever else comes to your mind in terms of the discussion we've had thus far, Edgar, you're going to go first. So the the only, only question that I, I I would like to um. Partly answer is um, the cybercrime question. Um, <clears throat> obviously, that the technical aspect to it, and if you th um, see also how law enforcement uh, works today, obviously there's a, a cyber component to many crimes today already, and then there are uh, <clears throat> kind of cyber cyber only crimes. So, um, <clears throat> if if it's a, if it's technology and uh, digital technology is, is used in in a traditional um, crime, and it's kind of a small scale. Um, crime, it can easily be solved, and um, uh, that's what law enforcement is good at today. Um, <clears throat> challenges, technical challenges, I mean, there are many legal challenges, but technical challenges are, um, in particular for small countries, uh, that the technology, if they're not suffi a sufficient amount of cases, that, they, um, that it makes sense for them to really know the technology. So just think of a uh, navigation system in cars, for instance. A, ca a car stores lots of information about um, uh, about uh, the driver and last trips, but having access, reliable access uh, to this information, knowing whether this information has been um, tainted, uh, you, you really rely on, on, on specified products for different brands of cars. And if there are not too many cases in your, in your country, it's, it's, it's hard to actually get to this information. And in a global scale with cybercrime, the, the challenges that, um, that we have experienced is um, uh, also, um, sometimes um, talking to, um, working a bit with with Europol, is um, the, uh, the the legal um, bound, uh, the legal constraints that law enforcement has. So it, it's really hard, um, even if there's the technical information available that could could solve a crime. It on, it's only feasible in really large cases, such as child exploitation or some some some. Uh, pay, payment fraud um, schemes where, it's, uh, where hundreds of people in different uh, uh, countries need to be involved, for instance, uh, to, uh, to, to seize um, uh, compu computers. And it only, so you can, you can be successful in doing cyber crime at, at a low scale um, if you globally distribute it, because then the effort for law enforcement uh, is just too large to. to to go after it, huh? and I think this would um, it, technically many things would be possible, but what still lacks and what would I think be important in, in kind of also future study programs is um, there are many reasons why this is then also 
uh, hard is kind of to make uh, law enforcement uh, more efficient in cross, uh, cross uh, uh, border investigations. Again, then there are many cases of how you could misuse this, but this would lead too far. Kind of Thank thing. you. Thanks, Julia. Um, so, yes, I also um, uh, just now address some aspects, but I found it very interesting, like the comment about this fast reaction, like if you, if you see something and then you react immediately. But, but of course, the platforms that we all use, they, 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 they want to uh, promote this behavior because they want to engage people and, and, and so it's rewarded if you are interacting a lot. And I mean, this is because, I mean, it's, it's about their business model because they... they, they uh, show you advertisement and they need much engagement and so it's it's also that um, of course everything is kind of uh, optimized that people stay and click and 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 um, yeah also this is what what also um, kind of um, makes or that, that that polarization is is kind of uh, always occurring there uh, more so it's it, the platforms have um, kind of not so much interest to prevent polarization, but rather to, to, to kind of um, yeah, foster it a bit. And, and, and so the thing is, so these um, yeah, other platforms that are, do not have this business model might also kind of allow a, a slower interaction, but, but like the platforms that are now like Twitter, Facebook, they, they do not have the interest, so also. And... Um, the, the other question, if I, if I um, understood it correctly, with um, whether about the algorithm or whether you can already, with the content creation, um, make sure that, that a lot of people kind of see it, or, or, or did that get it? So, I mean, um, um, the, the editors, so of the content, or, or yeah, exactly. like from the platform, or if I write a post, or yes, what? Yes, if you write a post, you yeah. already have on the content side kind of your input in this personalization. So, you choose which news do you want your audience to consume, plus the algorithm chooses the audience which wants to consume your content. So, it's kind of can we measure how, <laughs> how bad it gets in terms of like how my feed is yeah. extremely tailored? So basically, that I don't get the chaotic wrap of content, but I rather more of content, but I rather get only the stuff that the network wants me to get. You know. Uh, I mean, yeah, this, uh, different different things. That that I mean, you can of course maybe try to uh, look yourself for things you want to see and hope the system then learns. There is also a study. I mean, it's very hard to 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 um, see from outside why you get a certain recommendation. It's not clear at all because we do not know um, what what um, attributes, what what features are used to really make the recommendations, and it's even hard if you are like knowing more because there is a lot of these black box algorithms now like this deep learning based which are really black boxes you really do not know why a certain uh, um, recommendation is shown at this moment to you but what what you can do is you can can see when you really know about the algorithm which input data is used and you can do certain tests which impact certain types of input data has. But from the outside, so if we are watching YouTube, we cannot say at all because we are not from this company. And there is research done about misinformation and, 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 and try to see how, how bad it is really, for example, on YouTube. And what they try to do is that they make controlled studies from outside that they have accounts that are comparable, so that, that they do not have um, kind of click history before, so kind of new accounts with similar behavior, and then they see um, how, how, how much misinformation you would get after certain rounds of, of interactions. And what they also showed, it's a recent study, um, that, that you can influence it like in a positive way again. So if you then click on, on, on other type of content that, that, that debunks this misinformation, you get better content on the long run. But this is all you can, you can do now from, from outside, so yeah. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, 
I would like to, to address two questions that were posed and, and uh, appreciate the fact that this is the first audience that is writing full-fledged essays uh, in throughout <laughs> a panel discussion, so that, that, is, that is awesome. Um, that just to add to what you just said, there is also this, the topic on the technology of generative AI, so, so algorithms basically creating content on, them, on their cell, on their own, and what they have as data that trains them is basically also tailored by the algorithms that they're writing for. So we, we end up having bots writing content for themselves and we're just watching it or not watching it because they can do everything in between. So that, that, that starts to become a bit weird. Um, but technologically, we can do that. So texts are no problem, pictures are no, getting to be no problem anymore and we are starting to see videos as well. Um, so that's maybe is also something that is funny to watch right now. And, and then the brain teaser question regarding the normative, uh, whether or not we like seeing a democratization of, of, of the diplomacy. A, I don't really think we have a choice. Um, so whether or not I like that, it doesn't really matter. Um, B, since, since Immanuel Kant and, and modernity, a lot has happened. And I would argue that as smart as he was, probably was, and the others, um, a lot um, has happened that he, they probably didn't anticipate. And I would be very much interested, I'm not a philosopher, but um, very much interested in more recent um, yeah, thoughts on, on that. And I personally, to answer your question, I think it's a good thing that, that more people are able to participate in, yeah, in, in, in what we as a global society do with each other. Th that leads to a lot of um, problems that we have, but technology that we have enables us to hear much more people than what we were able to hear in the 17th century. So I personally think it's a good thing. Thank you, Tatiana. Yeah, just uh, to go back to the um, fast and slow ways of communicating in the same way that we hear uh, Ray waiting, waiting for our turns and meeting in the flesh and, <laughs> and the advantages that this have. Um, I think that what we are looking at, uh, the process or the, the phenomenon we are witnessing right now is, um, and where I personally think we are uh, heading, uh, is a scenario where we have increasing inequality, right? In the same way we have income inequality, and if you look at people's diets, not media diet, it's, I think the analogy is very good, but the way people uh, behave and eat, for example, you see that you have people from... Uh, if you are more educated or, uh, or a higher social class, you eat more organic food, you pay more attention, you exercise, whereas uh, in the middle there is no sort of middle class. And then you have the lower class uh, people that have a, a much worse diet, right? So I think it's not a very optimistic view, but we are going where we are heading, where we see, I don't have a crystal ball, so uh, I'll be happy to be wrong uh, on that um, as well, would be... Um, a scenario where you have this multi-speed ways of communicating very fast and also in a more moderate way, uh, but you will probably also have a lot of um, inequality where you have a certain group of people or an elite, as you, as you mentioned, that will master these codes and have time and will master fast messages, but will also take more time to discuss, exchange ideas, digest opinions. Uh, and maybe this will be these people who will still be elites that will continue to uh, be more involved in diplomatic process, uh, process, for example, or in leadership roles. And, um, and another group of people without much in between that will just get more and more used to consuming faster information in a more passive way, in the way it is presented to them in there as it pops up on their phones or uh, without that much um, questioning, right? So this is um, a bit of a gloomy picture, uh, but uh, Marcus will say something after that, so we will end on a positive note, I hope, um, so we don't finish the panel uh, depressed. But um, I believe this is uh, probably the way we'll be heading with these different highways uh, uh, coexisting, right? And then it gets back to the uh, if the diplomacy will be democratized or if it will still remain in the in the hands of the elite. 
um, yes and no, but on the one hand, elites have to pay more attention to what the people are tweeting about or talking about, where are their concerns, what will enter the so-called public policy cycle or foreign, po or foreign policy cycle, if you like, and this you can get a taste, um, test the water, get the temperature, uh, what people are thinking by looking at this, uh, what they share uh, or what they comment or they tweet or mastodon about uh, or they insta or TikTok about. Um, uh, while at the same time you keep probably having this elite who masters these codes and will meet in person and will exchange in a deeper level to build more trustworthy uh, relationships. I personally don't, I'm not sure whether full democratization in terms of diplomatic practices, uh, it has certainly advantages. In issues that have to do with national security, for example, it can be a bit complicated to have full people uh, participating in decisions where, I mean, you, you don't really know what, what is um, at stake, but it's more democratic than in the past, but I don't think that, that will not, in my opinion, prevent an elite from uh, standing out and actually um, managing uh, or steering the process somehow. Yeah, no, thanks a lot for, for, for the questions. The, the first one, the, the, this, this globalization, deglobalization, I basically always want to say that there's always both happening at the same time, right? So not, not like, uh, because there's some authors that say, so that first there's globalization, there's deglobalization, globalization, uh, but it's basically both happening at the same time, and there is often a sort of tension between them. So um, one, one example, for instance, uh, take the outbreak of the coronavirus, yeah? So then the, then, then the virus itself is actually uh, a manifestation of globalization, right? So it doesn't stop whatever at, at the borders. Um, and then uh, doctors in China figure out that something is happening, December 2019, and then something kicks in that, that you mentioned correctly, right? So, so that, so that, so that in, in China, obviously, everything is very, very tightly controlled, and then one of the doctors goes out on Weibo, and, and, uh, and, and says, well, something strange is happening here, and he thought it's the, it's the SARS virus coming back, the so SARS-CoV-1. Yeah? And it was not that far off, yeah? SARS-CoV-2. Um, and, um, and then eventually, uh, eventually then they figured it out, and then, they, then the, the genome sequence uh, was, uh, was uncovered and everything, and that was then uh, put on GISAID, which is, which is the, the, the platform used by medical practitioners worldwide. And uh, so, so, it's, so it's, it's oftentimes this, 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 on the one hand, this, this stifling the, 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 the global, the potentially global reach of, of, of the internet and of digital technologies. And on the one hand, that this global reach actually works quite well. And then and it causes all kinds of frictions. Yeah? This is where, where I see this globalization, deglobalization. And... Um, and with the democratization of diplomacy, the, the yes, I mean, so, so one, and, and, and as Tatiana mentioned, and, and, and I fully uh, sign up on that, yeah. so there are certain elements to that, so they take us back to Wilsonian dreams of a more transparent diplomacy and everything. Um, but there's obviously also the, all kinds of other things happening that are really worrisome, yeah. So I write a paper at the moment on populist diplomacy, for instance, yeah. And that to some extent, one may say, okay, there's actually a democratic element there, right? So, so the, the, the populist diploma actually doesn't take care all that much about what happens internationally, uh, but just looks at his or her, usually it's his, constituents. Yeah, so, so Modi, Trump, uh, lots, of, lots of other uh, cases. And um, so there is a close link there, but it's probably not the kind of democratic link that we would want. And then that has another effect that that person, oftentimes using uh, online technology, uh, obviously then blasts. So you have then this, the t Trump's Twitter diplomacy, which is very, very strange. Yeah? So uh, in many ways, I don't even know where to start. They're probably the strangest one with the North, Co North Korea, US. Yeah? So very undiplomatic. Yeah? So. Uh, I have a, I have a nuclear bomb. No, oh, I have the bigger <coughs> button, and you dotard. And I even had to check what dotard means and everything. 
So in that way, in that way, there is change of, of diplomacy, whether it's always to the better uh, or not, who knows. And then just very briefly, yeah, so we're going to take the, the digital law very seriously. Yeah? And, and so there are going to be classes in, that, in, the, in the new DIA on, on digital law and on, on also dealing with the cyber crime. There's also going to be a class on, 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 on security and cyber crime is definitely going to be part of that. And uh, there will be, uh, there's a whole module then for, for programming, actually for doing things. Uh, and, um, and then it will not just be a traditional master thesis, but it will also be a practical option uh, instead. Uh, so this, this, this uh, sort of practical doing things is actually very important. And that way it really is, it is studying and practicing uh, digital international affairs. Then, um, I would like to thank our, all our panelists, uh, and I learned they basically are all from the neighborhood. So, so I hope uh, I'm going to see you again soon. Many, many thanks for being here. Thank and thanks a lot to the audience.